All right, it's exactly 3.30 Eastern time, so um, I'm seeing a lot of people joining all at once. And are we recording now, Gina? Yes. Okay, then I'll get started. Uh, greetings, everyone, and uh, welcome to our NCME webinar series. Uh, this is our third meeting in the series, and this one we're going to focus on standard setting. And again, the purpose of the series is to look at what is the impact of the pandemic on various parts of assessment. So when standard setting must go on. Well, come on. There we go. Okay, so um, I'll introduce our panelists in a minute, but I just want to give you guys a quick overview. Um, we're going to have a couple different parts to this session. We'll do a short presentation by our panel, and then we're going to have a more majority of the time devoted to a discussion. And we've got a series of questions that have been pre-prepared, and we'll also open it up to all of you to submit questions. Um, you are muted. We keep you muted uh, during this uh, presentation for obvious reasons, um, but we really encourage you to use the chat function. Um, you should be able to uh, pull down the screen under more, it says chat, and feel free to engage with colleagues there, ask us questions. Um, we'll keep an eye on that and pull in chats as we can. We are recorded, so um, by staying on, you're agreeing to be recorded. And we do have a YouTube channel. So there is a link that's been sent out, but I find the easiest thing to do is just to go onto YouTube and search for NCME and grab the NCME channel. And then you can see the two presentations we've already given um, are already there for you to, to review. And this one will be up uh, probably by tomorrow. So let me do some introductions. I am Mary Ann Perry, uh, the president of Measurement and Practice. With us today, we have Casey Hogner-Bren from Tennessee. Eric Moyer from Pearson and Carla Egan from Edmetric. So I'm going to just, uh, we put these bios up on the screen. So I'm going to be quiet for just 10 seconds per screen and let you guys read this. So that is our distinguished panel. And I wanted to um, give you guys a little bit of context of some things we talked about as we were preparing for this uh, presentation and why standard setting is um, something that really has been affected very strongly by um, the pandemic. And I, I noticed as I was um, looking through the participant list, we do have folks from other countries. So just to say in the US, um, we have kids in all kinds of educational settings right now. We have remote, we have in person, we have hybrid, and Casey will give us more information on that. Um, we did cancel spring testing for 2020, uh, so the end of the 1920 school year, so we don't have any data from 20. Um, and we're expecting some oddities with spring of 21. Um, for the one, we're not convinced sure that every state will do testing, but for the ones that have testing, we are not expecting every student to test, meaning we don't expect every parent to agree to send their students to school for testing. So we don't know what the participation rate will look like, but we expect it to be a little lower than, than a normal year. And we're also concerned that it's not just um, random uh, lack of participation, that'll be very targeted. Um, what we're seeing in terms of participation in school is that it's students from um, the lower income neighborhoods or um, minority groups, but the higher risk students, students who aren't speak, don't speak English, are the ones that are not um, as often in the schools and so may not be in the assessment, which would give us non-random effects on uh, from the kids who do participate. And of course, we've got all this um, issues with the opportunity to learn and how the pandemic has affected that. Um, we have a lot of states and certainly a lot of districts have gone through different um, modes of participation. And in the United States, most of the uh, participation is district driven. So whether they're remote, whether they're in person or some hybrid of the two have been district decisions and it changes oftentimes throughout the year, oftentimes more than once. Um, in some states we had uh, states that actually said, 
we know this is going to be a tough year, so why don't you really focus on these standards? And they pulled out a subset of what they called key standards, meaning that the um, focus of teaching may be very different in the 2021 school year than in the previous or in the subsequent school years. We also have um, states and districts who have changed their academic calendar. Um, we'll see things like they've decided to uh, start a little later because they were hoping that the pandemic would get under control and they could bring kids back to school. So they said, well, let's postpone the start a couple weeks. Or they're just saying, we're gonna stop this earlier than normal because this is too hard on the pandemic years or they've shortened or lengthened uh, winter break or spring break. Um, for the states who are uh, moving forward with their plans to test, we've also seen cases where they've increased or lengthened their testing window, meaning sometimes they're starting earlier than normal, which would also change the opportunity to learn for the 2021 school year that would not necessarily be the same for other school years. So if all of that is going on, the concern is, does performance in 2021, is it, how representative is it of future performance? Um, and when we're setting standards, we're setting standards and we want to compare it over years. So it's important to be representative. So overall, a lot of the questions, the big question we're trying to, to think through is, if you're in a situation where you have to set cut scores, but you don't trust the data, what do you do? So our plan today, um, starting with Casey, dealing with the why question, um, why would you want to set standards in this kind of a circumstance? Um, and then turn it to Eric to say, and then how can we set standards under these circumstances? And then turning to Carla to say, and then what? Once we have our cut scores, how do we know they're any good? So as I said, each of our panelists is going to give about a five minute presentation. And then I've got uh, five discussion questions kind of pre-slugged. And I will be reviewing the questions that come up in the chat as well that we can address those as we go along too. So without further ado, let's start with why should we set standards now? Casey hogner -Wren of the is the Assistant Commissioner of Assessment in the Tennessee Department of Education. Well, thank you, Marianne. I think um, I, I don't have to, to tell you all the importance of, of standardized testing, but we will um, talk through a little bit about what we expect to see, how we normally use these scores um, in a context, and then which of these things are still important this year and, and which are not. I think, Marianne, some of the things you already touched on in terms of what we are seeing this year, um, we are definitely seeing in the state of Tennessee. So um, from a vast difference in instruction, what that looks like from school to school, um, the instructional calendars, we have some districts that started in July, some districts that waited all the way um, to the end of September to start. Um, and the ends of our calendars look the same, look very different. So I think that the all of those things that you have brought up, um, we are watching um, very closely in the state of Tennessee in terms of how our students are going to be in, um, experiencing instruction differently this year, and then how are they potentially then experiencing assessment differently. Um, obviously, we still need interpretable scores. So one thing that's really important in the state of Tennessee, we use these scores in a variety of ways, um, some of which I'm sure you all do as well, whether that's just for family information, student placement decisions. Um, if you are in a, a licensure or a uh, another opportunity that's not K-12 education, you're still needing to make those licensure and credentialing decisions, even if um, you're in a pandemic year and your test looks different. So grades, graduation requirements, um, and of course, what's really important this year, obviously, intervention, remediation, and supporting our students, knowing where they are. Um, in Tennessee, we have, we have our largest two districts in the state have actually not stepped foot in classrooms since last March. So we are approaching a year um, where students are not have not been physically next to their to their educators. So the the learning loss conversation is a large one in the state right now. Um, Tennessee is also slightly unique in that we use these data for educator effectiveness decisions. Um, we have teacher evaluation that is based on both achievement and growth. Um, that then plays into licensure, HR, hiring, firing, compensation decisions for our educators. Um, as well as the expected changes to instructional programs and professional development that we would expect to be seen after we get results and, and see how those results look differently across schools and districts. Um, and, and finally, looking directly at the results of those schools and districts, obviously we're using results for, for school and district accountability, for grading models, identification determinations at the federal level or exit criteria from those determinations. Um, instructional program evaluation and, and policy and programmatic support. 
So these things still go on. Um, so the, the need for these scores this year um, is a, not a normal one, but we have all of these things still to do. Um, and actually we have even more to do. Um, and so Marion, on the next slide, I'll, I'll say, one of the things that we've been looking at in the state of Tennessee is what do parents, what are our stakeholders feeling about this year? What do parents need? What do, what do our teachers need? Um, and we've actually done multiple polls um, in partnership with a, a local education advocacy organization. And what we've seen is that actually par parents, um, their view of education in the pandemic has slightly shifted over the past several months. Um, we are up to now a majority of, of parents being very concerned about their personal students' academic progress. Um, and saying, I, I have concerns that my student is still on track um, and I wanna know. If you actually ask not just about their student, but about all students in the state of Tennessee, that number goes up over 80%. Um, over 80% of students, uh, parents in the state of Tennessee feel that at least some students in Tennessee, they're concerned about their progress through this academic um, pandemic. And then if we ask, well, our assessments, our statewide summative assessments, the way that you should be measuring this pro the, the progress um, of our students, in a, in a normal year, over 80% of our parents are supportive of annual assessments. They want to see those results. They want them to be used in school and district accountability decisions um, because they want to know that their students are on track. Um, when we turn that around and say, okay, it's a pandemic year, do you still want to test your students? Um, those numbers, they do dip slightly, um, but we actually still see over 70% of parents when we say, hey, they may not be used for school or district accountability, but would you still like your students' results? Over 70% of, uh, of parents say, yes, we, we do. We want our students tested this year. We want to see those results. Um, so this, this is something that we're watching um, very closely because we want to make sure that we are doing um, what's right for, for our kids and, and making sure that we're, we have the data that they need to be successful. So on the next slide, we're, we'll look at what this actually looks like in a pandemic year. Um, so I'll have you click one more, Marianne, to see that there's actually new things that we are looking at. So this is a normal year plus plus um, on steroids. Um, I have crossed out a few things that as over the year, we have seen federal waivers, we've seen cancellations of, of summative assessments, um, we've seen local school boards and local state agencies making um, hold harmless determinations around things like local student grades um, or credit attainment. We definitely want to make sure that we're not penalizing students um, in a year where they may not be physically able to participate in assessments. And the same goes for, for educator, educator effectiveness and, and school and program decisions. We have seen the federal government issue waivers last year, um, and many states are, are seeking waivers again this year. Um, but even if we cross out a few of those accountability determinations, you can still see the importance of, of having interpretable scores this year, of meeting those cut scores to make determinations and to set performance levels for, for our students or our testers. Um, and we have a new one this year. Um, so in December, the president signed the second stimulus bill, we'll call it ESSER 2.0, um, that was passed by Congress and, and that provided over $80 billion um, in, in stimulus nationally for education funds. Um, that flowed through the, the, the basic education sta stabilization fund that we saw come out of the CARES Act last year, um, which means those dollars need to be spent in a very fast pace um, to make sure that we're supporting our students um, through, through um, what's happening right now in the, in the pandemic. Um, for the state of Tennessee, these dollars amount to more than a billion dollars that are flowing in that we need to make very quick decisions on how to support our students. Um, for those of you who remember, I came to the to Tennessee Department right after Race to the Top. Um, we drastically changed our entire statewide um, teacher, evaluation, teacher evaluation standards, assessments, all for $500 million. This is twice that amount, um, and it needs to be spent in half the time. And so when we're looking at how we're creating statewide programs, how local districts are creating programs to address learning loss, to address student need, um, many of these decisions will need to be made 
um, based on the, the results and the data that we see from standardized assessment. So in the state of Tennessee, we recently had a, a special session, a special legislative session last week. Um, our state general assembly has already passed bills creating statewide programs that prioritize these dollars for students who are scoring at certain performance levels. Um, and so we need these scores. We need these interpretable scores to make sure that we're prioritizing our supports correctly. We're qualifying um, certain schools or districts for the resources that they deserve. And we're making determinations um, that on programmatic or policy decisions based on what um, our students need. And, and so finally, in, in our last slide, um, we'll just talk through the final uh, need here, which is time. Um, so one of the, in thinking about why is this important to do standard setting? Well, why not just wait another year? Um, many states are in the situation that we are in and that we have already postponed. Um, so for, this is just a, an example. These are our new science standards in the state of Tennessee. We adopted new multidimensional science standards back in 2017, 18, when the world was fresh and, and lovely. Um, and then implemented the those new standards and we're very excited to do a field test in 2018-19. We turned that field test into our an operational test and we gave our first test in the fall of 2019 to our high school students on block schedule. Um, but after the cancellation of tests in, in 2020, which Marianne alluded to earlier, we did not give tests to our high school students um, in the spring or to the rest of our grade three through eight students. Um, however, we are planning to test those students this year. Um, so you will see three opportunities to test here between 2019 um, and 2021. None of those students um, that tested in the fall of 2019 have their scores yet. They're still waiting because we have not completed a standard set. And so when you're thinking about um, moving um, from this summer, knowing we didn't have impact data and thinking about the future, by the time we finish um, the standard set from this year, we will be looking at over two years of no data for, for students who have, who have taken the time, who have invested in these assessments. And so it's just a, a look for why this is so important to do now in this year. Um, we have all the reasons to use this data. We have students um, and teachers who are waiting on the data um, and a huge need to move forward um, in, in the work that we're trying to do in our state. All right, thank you, Casey. So um, that's an overview of what's going on in Tennessee in terms of why they have to set standards. So Eric has been in charge of actually setting them. So let's hear from Eric about how the cut scores are being set. Yay, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, th thank you, everyone. Um, so I, I was part of the team working with Casey back in uh, 2019, looking forward uh, to spring and summer of 2020, uh, preparing and planning for a, a regular standard setting um, when uh, our, our nice and fresh world, as Casey called it, changed drastically. Um, and everything was canceled in 2020. And as we started looking towards 2021, uh, the 2020-21 year, um, the question became, what do we do now? And uh, Casey laid out exactly that the option of um, not administering these, these assessments and providing results to the students was really not an option. We, we needed to uh, administer those assessments and we needed to find some way to provide results to them that were meaningful, uh, both to the parents, to the teachers. Um, and so the question really became, how do we do this? And that's when um, we started looking at this as an opportunity to, to see these as challenges that, that we could try to find some ways to overcome. Uh, some of the challenges that we just started looking at as we started discussing this, both uh, with the Department of Education and our TAC, um, with the TAC and internally here with our standard setting team at Pearson um, was the quick realization um, that the likelihood of holding in-person meetings was something that was not going to happen um, 
and was going to be something that wasn't going to happen for quite a while. Um, and that was a lot of the times because of travel restrictions within our own company. I, I know that, I don't know if other organizations have had uh, travel restrictions. I know that we still have travel restrictions um, now, even probably through June. Um, but then on top of that, you have local restrictions on group meetings. I know many states put restrictions that you could not have uh, groups more than uh, five people at times, um, sometimes even less. So the likelihood of having in-person meetings was something that was, was going to be a barrier to holding these standard setting meetings, especially since standard setting meetings, if you've been part of them or if you worked with them, require a lot of panelist engagement, both with the facilitator of the meeting and with it, within and between the panelists as they discuss their, their individual perspectives, um, their own individual judgments, um, the feedback data that we, we constantly give back to them. It is a very interactive process that we wanna make sure that panelists are completely engaged with throughout this. Um, and then a, another, a new piece is that if we go from in-person meetings to virtual meetings, the question became um, very quickly around the security of the meeting materials. Um, if we start holding these as virtual meetings, um, how do we ensure the security of both the process, the material, the, the uh, assessment items um, that they would get to see throughout the process, knowing how much time and effort, uh, both by the state and the teachers within the state who review the items and, and the vendor to create um, the different materials and the assessment items. Um, and then finally, to address something that Marianne brought up is how do you do a standard setting method that addresses the issue of having data that you don't really trust? Um, if you do a standard setting in, in spring 21, whenever you don't really know what the student population that is, that's going to take the test and what impact the, um, the educational um, environment and the opportunity to learn, as well as the opportunity to display um, or to demonstrate their learning um, is having on student performance. Um, so we took those challenges and we started thinking through them and, and how, how do we overcome them? So Marianne, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, quickly, we went to going towards a virtual uh, process for holding these standard setting meetings. Um, luckily, with our standard setting team, um, we, had, we have been working for several years um, to using a standard setting, uh, the Pearson standard setting website as a tool um, for facilitating um, standard setting meetings. Um, and whenever we did them, we did them in person, but we just used the website as a tool for both storing and sharing materials um, in a standardized way, um, collecting panelist judgments, um, and just maintaining in internal security procedures throughout the process. So we had a tool that utilized a website and a virtual uh, method for facilitating the website, but then we needed to have some way of encouraging and utilizing um, panelist engagement. So we, we actually went through several, several trials of looking at um, some of the different virtual uh, methods, and we've all become very familiar with e whether it's Zoom or Teams or WebEx or one of those. Um, we worked through all of those and, and actually had a lot of time to discuss which ones we wanted to use. We eventually ended up using Zoom. Um, we can talk about why. Uh, but we decided to use Zoom for engaging the panelists throughout the process um, and training, uh, doing the training by the facilitators um, and using that for the whole group discussions. Um, and then the, the other decision that we made um, was which methodology to use. So uh, if, if we have data um, that we, we are very questionable um, that, or, or that we don't know um, how useful that data is, student data is, we wanted to make sure that we had a methodology um, that, could, that we could use in that situation. 
Um, we ended up going with a modified, uh, the extended modified yes, no Angoff method. Um, and the reason was, is we wanted to do really a content focused standard setting. Now, and this is going based on, based on the idea that the assessment that we were setting standards for is a criterion, is a criterion assessment. So we have PL, we, we um, there were going to be PLDs, uh, statements of basically of what students at each performance level need to be able to demonstrate um, of, of what they know are, and are able to do for each achievement level. And so we know what students have to demonstrate. It's not something that's norm referenced. It's really based on the content. So in, in talking with the TAC, um, and, and the Department of Education, we decided to go with a uh, focused content um, standard setting methodology. We did not uh, share student performance data throughout uh, in the process. And actually we held the, we have actually already held the standard setting uh, prior to the administration. So we didn't have student performance data, um, but taking some of the advice um, that we have we have heard from uh, um, throughout this this process, um, we are actually going to be holding an articulation meeting um, after the spring twenty one administration, where we can take a look at the recommended cut scores from the uh, panelists from the standard setting, and look at how those cut scores. Uh, work across the different grades to make sure that as a system they work, which is kind of similar to what we would typically do, but then also taking making sure um, that if we take into account student performance, we're going to look at how how we can use the, the performance data uh, with uh, both as a whole and and probably with some sampling uh, to try and get some student data that is at least somewhat representative of a normal uh, student performance and see how the articulation would work with that in those situations so that, so that the department along with uh, pa select panelists from the standard setting committee can look at that information and see if there's adjustments to those content ba based um, recommended cut scores. Uh, and if there's any adjustments that they think need to be made. Um, because one of the things that we are we are are also concerned about, and this is one of the things that has been discussed was discussed with the TAC and, and with the department, of uh, this is a judgment process. So even though we we really try to focus the teachers on the content throughout the process, these teachers are going through the same circumstance. And we're asking the teachers, how would a student at this achievement level perform whenever they're thinking about this item? And they can focus on the content, but, but in other circumstances, some of them may still have a challenge of, okay, yeah, uh, in a normal circumstances, this is how they might do, but they may be putting in some um, adjustment to their judgment based on how they see students learning this year. And we want to give them the opportunity to look at that. And then on top of that, the um, and I didn't put that here in the slide, but the department has, has also discussed holding a validation um, next year after the 2022 administration to relook really at the, those cut scores and, and, and have one last look to make sure that there's no COVID adjustment that kind of has been added into the cut scores by the by the teachers. Marianne, can you go to the next slide? So in working through this process, it wasn't just we, we just kind of threw everything and said, we're just going to do it virtually. We actually went through a really uh, detailed process of how to make sure that everything that we did uh, was going to work in a virtual uh, setting. So one benefit that we have with our standard setting team is within Pearson, we have a whole other part of, um, uh, of our psychometric group that has some have done virtual standard settings in the certification world. Uh, so we actually took some time to sit down with uh, our, 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 the breadth of experience within our psychometric group to discuss some of the different ex uh, experiences and, and tools that people have, have used um, across uh, Pearson. Um, and I've also had the opportunity to talk with many uh, people outside of Pearson who have had experience with virtual standard settings to talk about how do we ensure 
um, panelists' engagement throughout the process. What do we have to do with our agendas and uh, the planning of everything? And then also, what do we do about item and meeting security? Uh, once we took that, we actually created a process um, within Pearson that we then did like a beta test. We actually uh, took an entire day um, and we took uh, content people and psychometricians within Pearson and we actually ran them through the entire standard setting process. Um, several might be on the call today and remember that day. Um, but from that, we actually met with everyone afterwards and talked about what worked, what didn't work, what did we need to change, what adjustments to the process did we need to think about, and we made some significant adjustments to the staffing as well as the pace and some of the tools that we use. Um, as we went through this and adjusted that process before we brought it to the Department of Education and then walked them through the entire process and the materials and the temp and um, and the uh, and everything that we were gonna do through the standard setting to make sure that they knew what was gonna be happening and how it was gonna be happening uh, before we actually fi did final preparation of the materials for the actual standard setting. Uh, that happened actually uh, starting back in, um, I, wanna, I wanna say it started back in the summer of 19. Um, and we started working through all of that process so that we were able to have a um, standard setting um, that we actually held in this past fall uh, of, of 20. Um, if you want to go to the next next slide. So since yeah, I'm going to ask you to speed it up just a bit, Eric, because you're 13 minutes into your five minute presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm really quick. This, this last thing is really quick. Um, so since then, we've actually held a, a virtual PLD review meeting uh, where we actually walk through uh, reviewing the PLDs for the science um, meeting and then holding uh, standard setting meetings for three through eight science and biology for Tennessee. Um, and getting those results, reviewing those results. And right now we're preparing for the articulation meeting that we will be holding uh, in right after, uh, shortly after the spring 21 administration and the analysis of the data. So we're looking forward to continuing to work through the process with the Department of Education as we go through this. Thanks, Eric. Okay, so let's go to Carla to reflect on this and then talk about what else should we be thinking about? So I wondered if Eric was going along. I was, it's sorry. Be, it's good to be on here. It's great to see all the names. Um, I actually miss you people and it'll be nice to be in person again. As we think about the standard setting and doing this virtually and doing it in the midst of an ongoing pandemic, once the standard settings are held, the question becomes the usual questions, and we have the usual suspects who are answering those questions. You know, we have to think about validating cut scores. And with standard setting, that always comes back to process validity. And we ask ourselves, you know, is, is this an established procedure? Um, is the design well specified, well enacted? I love what Pearson did by having a dry run of the workshop to try to work out the, the kinks in it because that helps as we're trying to implement this, this is a new experience for all of us. And you know what I've seen is that panelists have been more forgiving than they might be at an in-person meeting because everybody's getting used to doing these things online. We're also, and I heard Eric talking about this, you know, as we're going through this, we wanna have TAC review and oversight I think it's really important as we're doing the standard settings this year that the tax are either online watching, if we get to start traveling again, that they're there in person watching. In those online environments, it's a good way for the tax to see if people are um, actually attentive to the process, do they understand the process, and of course there's the panelist feedback. So that's all the stuff that we, we do all the time anyway in the standard setting. On the next slide, we have our unusual suspects. And so impact data, I mean, that's usually going to be Stephen Baldwin in the usual suspects lineup, is now Ronald McDonald. We 
we don't know if we can trust this data anymore. We don't know if it's comparable to the data going forward. Well, who's in this student or who is in this data set? Who does it represent? So usually we, we're not hugely worried about who's, you know, we're worried about who's missing, but we don't have large swaths of students missing from our data. And now it's possible we could have students not missing at random. As I think about standard setting, I think the right call is not to show impact data. And that is the opposite of what I would normally say. The, but I would bring it back. I would not show impact data in a, the content-based standard setting. And usually I would say we should do that. So we should give the people um, a chance to see how their cut scores are going to play out in the real world. But I would still bring the impact data that we have to a policy group. I would, I would lay out what this data looks like. I would tell them where the weaknesses are in this data. I'd also bring in opportunity to learn and talk about how, what do the cut scores reflect. And I've seen a lot of conversation as on, the, on the chat about, you know, will PLDs mean the same thing? Or how are people going to interpret? How are they going to set cut scores this year versus other years? As members of tax, we've had a hard time getting our heads around what does the data look like? What does it mean? What are the studies we should do? So I don't think we can ask people in the standard setting to do that. But I do think we can take it back to a policy review and have those questions. And so it's going to be maybe slightly different than other policy reviews. The other thing I've heard kicked around a lot is the cut score review. And should we review those cut scores the next year when everything's back to quote unquote normal? I am not, I'm not a huge fan of cut score reviews because once a cut score is set, I want stability for the process. I want stability for the testing program. So I can, I lean towards the side of not doing a cut score review the next year because there's many reasons that, that people could change it that have nothing to do with the content. So I think when I say, well, now what? My now what is, let's do our usual process. We're gonna do our usual process of validating. And now we're gonna do some unusual things where we really break down this impact data, we look at it and we bring it back to a policy group. And that policy group may actually include the state psychometrician and people that aren't normally at the table to talk about what does this mean and what does this look like? I think the last thing we want from a standard setting this year is to set cuts, to give cut scores to the public that don't make sense on, on their face. And if cut scores come out where kids do better this year than they've done in the past, I think it's gonna set alarm bells off for people. So I think these steps are gonna be really important as we're going forward. Thanks, Carla. And that's the way you do five minutes there. I appreciate that. You're the one who nailed it. Okay, so I just wanted to give you guys a preview of the five questions I'm going to ask so that if questions you have aren't um, incorporated here to go ahead and throw them into the chat. Um, and then we're just going to go through these one at a time. Um, and the first one is actually something that was in the chat quite a bit. So I am going to add another question from the chat. So I'm really going to throw you off, Casey. Uh -oh. But I think I think you'll be all right. Um, so the question was, under what circumstances is standard setting necessary this year? And you talked about um, the fact that your teachers have been teaching uh, to the new standards. This is the second school year. And so they need feedback on how they're doing compared to what the intended target was for the kids. Um, but one of the questions in the in the chat asked, is there any appetite for setting a cut score for the 2021 school year for the purpose of giving feedback, but then setting another one when we have better data so that this would just be a placeholder and not the start of a trend line? Yeah, that's a tough one. And I, I did see some of the, the questions popping up at the beginning about, man, Tennessee, you're in a tough spot for, <laughs> um, for, for being in, an, in the need to st set standards in a pandemic year, but we are not alone. And if you're thinking about, you know, um, 
certification exams, they're they're in the same uh, they're in the same boat as well. Um, new standards and then any blueprint changes, any changes that we've made to a test, even if a state didn't change their standards, changing the test dramatically, um, shortening it, et cetera, you're still going to have to go through this process. So um, in terms of, of looking at a, a, a different cut for this year, um, I think in the state of Tennessee, in many states, uh, after we've kind of gone through the wave of, you know, the standards that should no longer be named um, and, and coming out on the other side and thinking about our own state standards, um, it's really important that we understand what the bar is, um, what success looks like um, on our state standards, and how students can demonstrate that they have mastered those standards. And that's really important. And I don't, I don't think that we need to, um, you know, say we have a criterion reference test and then change the bar a year later. Um, and so I think that that's really important to say, nope, um, we're, we're doing this content standard set because we believe that we need to set a very clear bar for what our standards mean and how a student can demonstrate those standards based on these very clear performance level descriptors um, and borderline level descriptions and, and everything else um, and make sure that the field is aware that the, the cuts um, are interpretable, how the, the final results of our students this year compared to last year or the next year is what might look very different. Um, so I think I think we're not the only folks in this situation. Um, there's there's multiple different situations that we can see states in um, in terms of the circumstances that they would need to set um, set standards. So one is the the place that we are in, right? That we've already delayed. We saw a lot of states cancel standard setting last summer when they did not have impact data. They had to change their plans. They had to rethink which methodology they were using um, without that data. And so, and they just had uh, issues, as Eric talked about, just not being able to physically meet in person. And so we, we had to scramble quickly to cancel those meetings and think about um, how the world would look different. Um, and now we've already delayed, right? So many states have already delayed a year. Now you're in a situation where, where teachers have been teaching for two or three years on standards that they have not received feedback on. And so that's incredibly important. And I think you, you also have a situation in which states have plans to do new things this year, right? They had plans on rolling out new standards. They had plans on rolling out new blueprint changes, um, or they made changes to their blueprint as a response to the pandemic. Um, they shortened, shortened their test. They took out um, constructed responses. They decided to do only one of two subparts, for example, as we heard in, a, in uh, previous webinars. So there are things that you would need to do an adjustment on your cut scores to make sure that the scores were interpretable and appropriate. Um, and finally, we were thinking about um, the future of assessments, the fact that innovations are still moving forward. We are, we're wanting to move forward with, with through course, with, with adaptive testing, with um, moving into, into new modes and, and new technologies um, around our items. And we still want to make sure that, that the results that we're producing and, and we're able to continue testing and moving forward. So I think there's multiple reasons states could be in these situations or, or professional organizations could be in these situations. Um, you saw some of them in the chat, right? The changing of, of how we're assessing a specific skill. That doesn't change the bar that a, a person needs to hit in order to demonstrate mastery, but we're thinking about differently how we're assessing that, which is important. And so having these conversations now, instead of delaying or issuing um, a different type of interpretation, May, means that, that you can um, hold consistent expectations for your standards and your educators, and you can continue moving forward um, with innovations and plans that you, that you have um, already on the docket. Thanks, Casey. I'm gonna go ahead and jump to question two, because that was a pretty thorough answer to the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I am gonna start with you, Eric, on this one. But when you think about, um, You've already started by saying you want to use NGOFs. You're not requiring um, calibrated items to order like a bookmark. You're not mm. requiring impact data. But you know, Carla recommended maybe we should do some kind of a policy review afterwards where we give them these kinds of data. Mm -hmm. So as a psychometrician who has to look at these data, I wanted to ask you, what kinds of analyses would you be doing to analyze the participation rate and to figure out how representative is this of the state and, and what advice would you bring to a policy kind of meeting um, post standard setting to help them interpret the uh, impact data? That's great. That's a great question. Um, 
One of the, the biggest challenges is really that both the uh, student population that is testing, um, but as well as, as well as the the unknown uh, of what the what impact the COVID um, is going to have across the different groups within that population. Um, and so one of the, we, we wanna look at impact data. I mean, typically whenever we do standard setting, we, we look at impact data. That's one of the big ones that we look at both um, as we classify students into their achievement levels, but then also student performance um, at each of the individual item levels, whether it is with an ANGOF, we look at p-values, we look at score distributions, but then if you do a bookmark, um, or, or, or a ID matching, um, you order the items ba based on student uh, item difficulty. Um, you really want to try as you start doing what Carla is discussing, uh, some type of policy impact um, review. You, you really want to try to see if there's some way to do some type of a sampling. Um, that's going to be one of the things that we're going to be looking at as we continue to work with Tennessee, uh, moving towards an articulation meeting. Um, we want to look at seeing if there's some way that we can do some type of a sampling, if it's uh, to to get a some type of a representative using either previous student data, which really at this point is back I mean, we might have to go back and do some matching back to 2019 um, as we start looking at that. Um, some of the other things that we, we're looking at sharing with the panelists um, and also stakeholders as we do this articulation meeting is also looking at previous um, student assessments. So uh, depending on uh, how, how big of a shift in the standards or in the testing, um, it does give us some benchmark that we can take a look at. Uh, and like uh, Carla, Carla mentioned, and I think Casey, men uh, Casey mentioned, if you have a test where the standards have increased uh, or th they've significantly increased the standards and the, and the test is supposed to be a test that is of higher rigor, but then you look at those cut scores and, and you have um, a lot fewer students in those lower achievement levels, uh, th there's a little bit of a gut check there that says there, th those cut scores might have been influenced by something else. And then there needs to be some look, looking at the data and looking at how students are performing and looking at some of those different ideas. So we're trying to go through and look at all of the different pieces of data um, that we can bring to this articulation and policy meeting, including uh, student impact data, both current uh, student in, um, currently and also in previous assessments. Um, with a, we, we did also social studies where the standards didn't change much, but there was a blueprint change. Um, so, and we have items um, that were from that and item parameters. So we can actually take a look at where those cuts would be on the new assessment. So we're finding all of those, some of those bridges that we can use to look at how well, um, how the cut scores actually from a, almost like a face validity standpoint match up. Um, so those are some of the different analyses that, that we're looking for and we're continuing to discuss with the department and with the TAC um, if there's other ways that we can use the student performance data in 21 to evaluate the cut scores um, come the articulation meeting. Carla, what are your what are your thoughts on this? Um, should there be um, additional analyses going on here? And I know someone in the chat raised the possibility of using the field test data for these same items from the 2018-19 school year. Mm -hmm. That's a great. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I agree with what Eric Eric laid out. I I think in terms of of this, like I said, in terms of this data bringing impact data the standard setting I don't think will be as will be as useful this year and really mm -hmm. once we have data in hand I think we're going to have to do more sampling and create weighted samples more so than we ever have before so that the data we can make sense of the data and I think that's going to be really important to do before states release their cut scores mm -hmm. 
So from a policy perspective, Casey, how do you feel about uh, trying to explain weighted impact data to the field? Is yeah. that something you think is going to be the solution? And we, it really is about a communication at that point. Yeah, we, we actually just presented to our State Board of Education around the, the choice of methodology for this standard setting. Um, in Tennessee, we've previously used bookmark method. And so um, having to go into depth over why we decided to, to change and use the, the ANGOF, why we had wanted to focus and do a content only standard set, and then how we're going to supplement that and not solely rely on the impact data um, was actually very well received by our state board uh, and, and by our educators who want to believe in the quality of the standards and the high expectations that we have for our students and, and want to move forward there. Um, for I do think that it's important that all of the, the pieces of data that I've seen mentioned in the chat and we've mentioned um, are things that we've talked about, right? So the field test data um, from previous years comparing um, certain items that we've used for social studies, for example, who not, might have survived the blueprint change, looking at that over time. And remember um, for our fall, um, for our, our high school test, our biology test, we actually gave that form in 2019 pre-pandemic and decided to reuse the form for fall 20 um, to see changes and, and be able to, to compare and use that information as we're um, doing these policy considerations on the back end. So I think um, I think focusing on a content-based um, methodology is easier to communicate um, than, than talking about, you know, how, how student impact data may have potentially changed um, our interpretation. But I do think that, that, you know, Eric using the term gut check is important, um, that we want to make sure um, that we're all humans in this process and we are making judgments and that we have very, um, very clear reasons to, to critically evaluate and look at the validity of those, of those judgments on the back end. That's great. And I want to um, piggyback off of that um, along with something in the chat as, there we go, as I move to question number three. Um, because again, in addition to who's participating, so who's going to actually take the test this spring, we've got the issue of, of those that took the tests, they're going to have different opportunities to learn. Um, and in mm -hmm. some ways, that's always the case, kids get different opportunities to learn, unfortunately. But in this case, it's truly exaggerated this year. Um, so a couple of the comments that have come up in the chat have to do with, um, should we be trying to benchmark this against NAEP, which unfortunately was canceled for 2021, um, or looking at ACT or SAT data, or are there other external sources we should be using um, as we think through this? And, and Carla, I'm gonna have you jump in on this one first. And Marianne, I wish I had a good answer to that question. One of the things that I've seen go through on the chat is this idea of getting panelists' perspectives on, I'd really like to do some think alouds with panelists, on what they're thinking about as they're setting these cut scores. Because part, when I think about the fidelity of data for standard setting, what's important is the panelist's interpretation. But not only that, and, and Andrew Ho made this point in the chat earlier, will people interpret PLDs in the same way? And you answered, mm -hmm. well, theoretically, yes, they should. Mm -hmm. But given the pandemic, I don't, I don't know. And so it would be nice to, so for those of you who are implementing standard settings this year to have at least survey questions embedded in, in your survey to try to get at how panelists are interpreting setting these cut scores that might be different from previous years. When I think about the fidelity of the data that we're going to see, my, I mean, my biggest concern remains that the missing not at random piece because we know that there's an impact of opportunity to learn. We know that it's differentially distributed in this country and within the United States. And so I'm worried that our data, because we have this, we'll have a chunk that's missing, not at random. I'm not sure that the data we get will reflect the range of opportunity to learn that we know is out there. So, you know, if, if I'm in a state, what I'm wanting, the other things I'm going to want to collect are the percent of zeros that students are receiving. Um, any type of information I have on attendance, or even if the school collected attendance, the percent of time they were remote. And so with, with all of the data, I'm 
I'm gonna, I wanna look at the school districts or the corporations who are in there versus who aren't in there, how they were, um, how they were teaching students this year. Mm -hmm. And then how were students, how do we get at how were students receiving that information? Mm-hmm. And all of this is important because this is what we bring to the standard setters. We would typically bring the standard setters to say, okay, let's make sense of your cut scores. And I don't think we can do that this year. What kind of data do you have, Casey? Do you have um, actual attendance by type of attendance data? Um, theoretically, yes. However, um, <laughs> as, as uh, our Pearson colleagues on the phone know, as we've tried to dig into that attendance data to even look at st- sampling plans, equating plans for, for the spring, it's incredibly, incredibly noisy and messy. Um, we have districts who have, uh, we have I- implemented new attendance codes to track students who have, for example, being placed on remote or distance instruction from, um, from being in a quarantine, et cetera. Um, and and districts are implementing that in a non-random way, right? So, so we are um, we had hoped to be able to use um, other types of, of information, like what we know about the types of instructions being employed by certain districts, um, using new attendance codes, for example, to evaluate um, uh, student participation um, and, and attendance and compare that. Um, and we're also looking at what we're seeing in the actual testing as well. So in the fall, um, we had about a 78% participation participation rate in our first fall testing window, um, more than 80% of our districts were over 80%, which is really exciting. Um, but those missing students um, do not look the same as the average student, right? And so we're, we're really digging into that and understanding how do we get that impact data down to a sample of, that's more representative um, and, and think through the how the, some of the noise and messiness of this data is impacting how we're interpreting it. Thank you. And Eric, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about what you and Krista Molesky had on the, the chat about, is there a, a differential concern at different performance levels? Are we more concerned about, um, and Chris, I think, put the fragility of a cut score at advanced versus basic? Um, and, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, um, I, I think that was a great question. It's something that actually um, Casey and I have looked at with the data with our psychometric group. Um, and actually, what we're, the cut score that we're actually more concerned about with, with this um, opportunity to learn perception, I guess, with the teachers is really the lower achievement level. Um, because if you see teachers who think that there was a, or have a perception um, that the learning environment this year was not as conducive or students had a much more difficult time learning, um, what's gonna, what we see happening is that whenever they make that judgment about how students could possibly perform on specific items, they're going to see those items as more difficult for, especially for those lower achieving students. Um, higher achieving students, what we see, what, what um, and, and as we are looking at the cut scores for some of the, um, from the results, we're seeing the um, cut scores for some of, for like the proficient and for, um, and in this case, level three, and level four, um, kind of where we would expect them to be um, based on, um, we haven't seen the impact data yet, but but it, they seem reasonable. Um, but whenever we look at that, that um, lower level um, cut score, we're seeing that the panelists put those cut scores very low, uh, which means that they're, they're either um, looking at the test is going to be extremely hard uh, for these students or that the student performance is going to be extremely low for them to get into those achievement levels. So um, so to answer uh, Chris's question, the, I, I'm really concerned more about setting standards and, and really the review of those lower achievement levels uh, more than the, um, the higher, the, the advanced or even the proficient one at this point. Thank you. Um, so let's go to our fourth one about, you know, we've talked a lot about at this point, people are saying we're so afraid of the data, we don't want to do an approach that requires us to use pre-calibrated items, that we want to be able to use items um, uh, and just focus on the content, just focus on um, impact data. Um, you know, what other kinds of things are we looking for um, in terms of We've talked about 
different data in terms of attendance and opportunity to learn. Um, you know, Carla talked about we don't really have a huge amount of um, knowledge in general about the opportunity to learn for students. And this is why we rely on the PLD so much that we're right. saying for a student who meets this definition, if they mm -hmm. know what's in this definition, what percentage of them or would they answer this item correctly? Um, and we're trying to keep it to that. But, but what are the other key things we need to focus on? And Eric, I'll toss this one to you first. Um, I think trying to find methods that really do try to minimize the student performance, since that really is the big question. It's the unknown um, this year. We don't know how students are going to perform on these assessments. And that's really why we're giving um, these assessments this year um, across the state. And Casey, Casey showed this in her, in her slides, that teacher parents are concerned about where are their students. They, they don't know, and we don't know. And so as we're, um, we're looking at moving forward, uh, things that really focus on student performance is really a challenge. Um, I thought one of the one of the questions that someone brought up, and I, I'm sorry I didn't get to see who brought it up, was the idea of a cro contrasting groups and, and bringing teachers into the process um, of taking students and having them both look at the test um, and looking at the PLDs and, and really doing that classification for actual individual students and then um, how students based uh, looking at how students performed. Um, that, that's an interesting idea. Um, and, and that might be a, an additional piece of information that you might want to bring into um, a more content focused standard setting. But as we were looking at this process, and I'd love to hear if Carla has any other, other thoughts, but uh, with the criterion based test, um, one where we really do want to say, that a student at uh, level three on track knows and is able to do this. Um, we really do want to try and focus it on a, a very content focused main standard setting methodology. I, I, I agree. And as I'm watching the chat where Billy Skorupski put down a wrong opinion, um, that what I'm really concerned about is it really, I think that a lot of this is going to come back to a training issue. Mm -hmm. So psychology is such a huge part of the standard setting. Right. And when we're doing standard setting in a year that has been crazy, we have, we're going to have to probably spend more time talking explicitly to panelists about you're going to use your PLDs. We understand that children have not had the opportunity to learn this year. They might have had in previous years, but we want you to use these PLDs. This is the expectation, and we want you to go in with that in mind, but I think we have to address the opportunity to learn, how you look at PLDs. Some of the things we may not have done explicitly in the past, I think we have to do it explicitly this year to address basically some, some of the psychological demands that are going to be there in the standard setting because people are coming off of a rough year. Right. Yeah, and I think I'm just going to jump in for a minute, but with Billy's comment and, and for those of you that didn't read it, it has to do with um, isn't standard setting, setting supposed to be criterion reference? So do we ever really need impact data? And sure, theoretically, that all sounds mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest issue for me, um, slightly different from what Carla said, is the idea that, you know, the past, gosh, Fifth, probably 19 years now, we've been thinking about um, really developing standards that show a progression from third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade. And with that progression, we expect to have um, the same progression showing in, a, in our uh, articulated achievement standards. And so if I'm looking at a student and they really are learning a year's worth of material every single year, I don't want them to be proficient one year and basic the next and advanced the next and then basic again and then proficient. I don't know how to interpret that. So I think really bringing in the, the impact data really helps make sure that the interpretations make sense logically, not just within a year, but across years as we're looking across this, um, the grades. Um, I don't know, Casey, if you have any other thoughts on this one. If not, we'll go to the fifth one. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it, to your earlier message in the chat, Marianne, there's there's one thing that's in theory, but then in practicality, I think mm -hmm. um, to to do this without 
you know, completely agnostic of data is assuming we have absolutely perfect PLDs that can capture every single um, thing perfectly and that every single human would interpret those PLDs the exact same way. And, and I think we know that neither of those things are true. And so understanding one, for this specific year, how are we training our panelists? How are we bringing in content experts who may not have been sitting in the same rooms with our students, who may have different interpretations um, and who may not be necessarily as, as influenced by a COVID effect, for example? How are we um, really understanding you know, what we expect to change over time versus what we do not expect to change over time um, and thinking about those in, in context of, of the standard setting for this year? All right, so I think this is the huge question for a lot of people is, is what follow-up studies need to be done and then when do you do them? I mean, uh, Carla brought up the idea of, of as soon as you have some impact data, sit down with some policymakers to look at that impact data um, compared to where the cut scores were. Eric talked about the vertical articulation that was needed at that point to make sure we do have consistency across our grades. Um, but let's think even further because there's certainly been a lot of comments in the chat about um, concern that this isn't just a one-off that while yes, this is the worst year, we hope, in terms of um, anomalies and teaching, kids aren't gonna automatically fall right back into place and be where they're supposed to be in 21, 20, 21 22, even if we're all vaccinated and they have a cure. It's not just gonna be boom, we're back to normal, we can keep going. So what other studies should we be thinking about and when would you think about doing them? Um, Carla, I'm gonna toss this one to you first. You know, I, well, to, to backtrack a little bit, I think what you said is really important because this really is, whether we have standard setting or we don't have standard setting, we're kind of resetting trends. All either a new, brand new trend with standard setting or we're gonna see data fall off in ways we're not used to seeing. And that's not gonna come back immediately. That's, that's gonna be a multi-year process to get kids back to where, where we were in 2019. So, you know, as I think about as I think about follow-up studies, I think they really fall outside of the realm of standard setting. I mean, I've already come down on the side of I wouldn't do a cut score review in the following year. I would try to, you know, work all of that out the year. If I have to set cut scores this year and there's no way to put it off, I, I want to go ahead and establish those cut scores. I don't want to do a one-off for the COVID year. I wouldn't want to do a one-off if we weren't setting cut scores. I saw that asked earlier too. And so if I'm doing follow-up studies, then you know the next year I'm going to be looking at especially the data where, that may have been missing and what's going on with those kids. I'm going to be really looking. At, I mean, I think this is getting out of the things that come to my mind are the things that get out of psychometrics and more into the teaching and content side for psychometrics what I'm really worried about are more of our equating practices and how are we making sure what makes sense that our test makes sense from year to year but maybe Eric you have more standard setting related thoughts let me just go off mute um, actually I think and Janine brought up the comment that, that I was actually thinking um, in, in here is, although I would love to say that this year we're going to, we are, and I know that, that my, my team and, and Casey are working to ensure that whatever cut scores we provide this year are, are cuts that are based on the content and that really do represent um, the knowledge and skills that are that are defined in those PLDs. Um, th this is, in, in the end, a, a judgment process, and we're going to bring data to try and and review and make sure that the that that the judgment process from the panelists really did capture what what it needed to capture as we go along. Um, but there is that that case um, of what happens if the, the cut scores did capture some type of a COVID effect um, and the cut scores are, are, are set too low um, because teachers uh, put some opportunity to learn or some other type of 
of shift in in the cut scores where where in the end we would like to um the the cut scores really don't are, aren't going to work over the long term as student performance goes back to where where it would be normally um I, i'm not sure if we would I'm, I'm kind of more on the side i would like to at least know that and, and then figure out what we would want to do about that um and if it's within some type of a range um, that this fir that first year maybe not do anything, but if we see that shift goes go over a couple of years down the road, um, I might do one next year, but I might wait another couple of years and then do another validation just to make sure that um, as student performance and as students catch up after this massive interruption in their education. Um, that that we may need to relook at a validation and maybe not next year but maybe in maybe in three or four years um and to relook at that and see if there's something that we're capturing that we might not be able to capture after only one year uh, of of a return to normal um the other thing i think is there are um, alignment studies that i know that that um, i have been a part of and that i've seen done where we have people come in and, and say, okay, here's where the standards are, here's the items. If you looked at this, does this actually, do the cut scores actually capture what is represented in those PLDs? And, and taking, a, um, taking an alignment look at that. And that may be something that we want to look at in a couple of years. And that might be really helpful um, as we really want people um, in, in the state and the parents to be confident that whenever we say that there is that a student is on track or proficient or whichever uh, level students use uh, or the state is using, that it really does mean what it's supposed to mean. Yeah, I want to throw out a couple of thoughts, um, some of them from the chat about. So supposedly we're going to have um, NAEP data from the twenty spring twenty or winter twenty one twenty two. Um, so if we have NAEP data in 23, if we, ACT and SAT are tough right now because it's more than just COVID. I think colleges are really trying to decide what they're going to do in terms of requiring ACT, SAT, which is going to change participation. But let's say that settles down in the next couple of years. Um, I know that's an if. Would we want to bring in some of those data and look at some of the um, uh, relationships between the cut scores on a state test to those kinds of um, external tests. And a question that came up in the chat too that I thought was really interesting is let's say in three years from now, um, we see a mismatch between um, where students are falling in terms of the uh, four performance levels and the ALDs. So when we do an item mapping and we describe what items are in each performance level, level, they don't match what the descriptor says. Would we be more likely to say, oh, we need a new cut score setting, or would we be more likely to say, no, we need to rewrite the descriptors? So Casey, I'm going to just throw to you for a, a policy perspective. I mean, you have been there long enough to be able to anticipate, what are you going to hear from your parents, your teachers, your legislators in terms of those kinds of concerns that they may see? Yeah, um, I abso absolutely think it's appropriate to bring in other pieces of data here. Um, in Tennessee, we census test for ACT. In fact, we provide two opportunities for all students to take the ACT. So that's actually a pretty rich data set for us. Um, we have over 97% participation of our, of our senior class. And so understanding if we truly believe that when we say on track in Tennessee, we mean on track for college and career readiness, how does that actually play out um, with other measures of college and career readiness? So I think these are questions that we actually get from state board. We get from educators about how the alignment looks for other national tests. So I think that that's, it, that's interesting and important to think about. Um, but I also think that it's appropriate to really dig deep into your PLDs. Um, and Eric and I have talked about this particularly in our social studies PLDs are, um, are they actually granular enough? And I saw this in the chat as well about wh what do we use for reporting versus standard setting um, and, and how detailed are these statements um, and in terms of what we expect our students to be able to know and do. And so I think looking, looking at those as well and understanding, well, what does the field interpret about what these different performance levels mean? Um, what information do they have about what these different performance levels, students that, who fall in these performance levels, what they know and, and can do? Um, and then how are we measuring that? 
And how does that overlap or potentially not overlap with other measures that, that the field has? Um, so they have off-the-shelf benchmark assessments, they have NAEP, they have um, ACT. Are there places where from a content perspective, there is an appropriate place to overlap and look at these data? And there is there a place where from a content perspective, it's actually not appropriate to compare. Um, and so we want to make sure, you know, the, the ACT science score and Tennessee science standards are very measure very very different things. Um, and so you want to make sure that that when you're talking about these things, you're being clear from a content perspective, um, what that actually looks like. So went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, I want to just throw out two questions. One is, is very practical. And I think it was as much for Eric um, that anybody who's done standard setting this year can address it. And that is this idea about when you're doing a standard setting online, um, how long should these meetings be per day and how many days? And there was some talk about, well, if we're virtual, can't we just make this last several weeks with shorter time? Um, so I'll be interested in, in Eric and Carla, your experience, because my experience has still been, my state clients are telling me, no, 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 it's still time away from the classroom um, because we're not gonna ask teachers to teach for six hours and then spend the next four, three or four hours on a webinar. So it's time away from the classroom. So you still have a maximum of five days, one week to get this done. Um, but, but what's your experience, uh, Eric, I'll start with you. That, that's a great question. Um, and actually, it was a question that we um, asked uh, of several people before we started going through this, um, especially uh, some of the people from Pearson View who, who had done uh, virtual standard setting um, in, in the certification um, landscape. Um, and what they found um, was actually whenever they tried to do shorter sessions over over many days, um, the actual participation um, what was actually actually decreased. And so people who may have started uh, the standard setting um, might not have finished it, or they weren't able to get people to be who were willing to um, invest five days to do a standard setting um, for for a test, even though you were saying it's like all you have to um, whenever you're doing this, you're, you're only going to need to be on online for maybe um, an hour for two hour or two hours during during that time. Um, so it was really uh, fr from quite a bit of discussion and research um, as we went through this that we found um, doing a standard setting in one day um, where it was really focused, um, but really putting in a lot of breaks. Um, we all know from being on virtual meetings that being, uh, I, I love the 90 minute uh, webinar that we have here because that seems to be about the length that people can be on a webinar without completely losing focus and needing to take, take a break for too long. Um, so that's what we tried to do, is we tried to make sure that whenever we broke up um, or, or we planned facilitation or discussions or other activities, we tried to put them in blocks of no more than about 90 minutes, and sometimes even, even less if we possibly could, and then made sure that we incorporated fairly significant breaks in between um, or the individual activities. So um, like in many uh, standard settings, you know that they have individual judgment opportunities. And so we would um, maybe do a train, we would do a training that might be 30 minutes, but then um, something that we might give in a in-person session, um, less time, we gave more time so that there was more, more time for them to get up, take, do whatever um, during the individual activity so that it wasn't as um, them just sitting for however long doing the individual activity or during the training for, for too long of a period. Carla, Great. I mean, I know that you've done lots of virtual or Casey, whatever your thoughts. So, I saw your uh, with, we've had lots of um, different ways we've implemented the virtual meetings and each one worked. To my, and it surprised me as we started this. So we have done asynchronous meetings that occurred over a week long time period. Okay. And the feedback from those meetings was, we love this. We can work on our own time. We can work at our own pace. We've done a, the 
Zoom rooms where we spent more of a traditional day, but our group leaders, we told our group leaders, just like Eric said, take breaks. The biggest thing that actually came up during that meeting was to turn, to keep your camera on because some of our panelists were getting irritated that their, their cohort, not everybody was on. Mm-hmm. Wasn't, and so they felt like everybody wasn't working. Right. Um, we've also done you know, like a expanded, we've done meetings at the end of the day after people were done working where they had to come afterwards to, to do the work for, for three or four days, it was four days during a week. And it, you know, it worked. And these workshops can really take on their own personalities. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's some of it. And if, and sometimes if you get a person in there who wants to drop a bomb, they, they can do it. And so I think one of the things when you're doing any workshop, but particularly virtual workshops, is really monitoring, um, monitoring the group and monitoring people who might be there to it has happened so rarely in my 20 year career, but I can remember a couple of times where you have a person who comes in who is re- really there to try to undermine the workshop instead mm-hmm. of trying to put good faith effort into creating cut scores or whatever the purpose of the workshop may be. Mm-hmm. But in an online environment, I think you really want to get to that. You want to take that person out. You want to come, you know, get to that person and really talk to them, see what the agenda is, and maybe ask, you have to ask them to leave the meeting. I will say that one of the, sorry. Uh, one of the benefits of, of the virtual meeting was, um, you know, Carla, at the very beginning, you talked about process fidelity and, um, and validity. And I think we were, we were able to have members of our TAC pop in on certain points of the day, right? They didn't have to fly to Nashville to do that. They were, they could, they could pop in, um, um, and observe that. And same with my team, my staff, we could, we could pop in and observe. Um, and we were able to give in the moment, you know, feedback to, um, the team around facilitators. Um, I do recognize recommend that your facilitators are, are highly trained on facilitating virtual meetings because there were definitely differences, right, in, in those who are able to engage all of the panelists um, and those who struggle to do that. Um, I will say, though, that we saw benefits of, you know, those quieter folks being able to engage on chat, for example, instead of, um, you know, being worried about raising their voice, um, it, you know, in, in conjunction to other folks. So we, we saw benefits, but I would say definitely making sure or that you have a very clear process and that, that there are checks in place for, for ensuring that, that that's valid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I wanted to ask one more question came up earlier in the chat that I do want to push on. I think we could talk about logistics forever with the people mm-hmm. who want to do this. Um, but another question, because we started this, Casey, with you talking about how your uses for scores have changed this year, that you're not going to use it for certain accountability purposes this year, but you are using it for things like determining how to spend resources. Um, so a question that I've seen throughout our, our chat thread is, what about the reports themselves? Will the reports have any kind of caveats or anything in them that lets people know this is different this year? And yes, it's a new set of cut scores and it's a new assessment, but it's also a new situation. So what are your thoughts about how, what should be communicated in score reports this year? Yeah, we, we actually considered a few different things. Um, at, at first, um, you know, we've talked through everything from issuing only um, performance levels and not scale scores or detailed um, differences to uh, only presenting uh, raw scores in certain um, cases and not, and we really have kind of mocked up some of those things and thought, you know what, this and workshopped them and thought not, these things are not going to be appropriate for our long term stability of this standardized program and to thinking very critically about how we're continuing to communicate with parents um, and and with families with with students themselves with our educators over time, we don't want those interpretations to change right. Um, and so we, we have decided to hold on on score reporting until we have confidence in our scale scores confidence in our performance levels, um, and then are sharing that information with the same level of detail, the the subscore reporting, the next steps, the strengths and weaknesses that our students demonstrate in the exams. Um, We want those to be content-based. We want them to support instructional decisions. 
Um, and so we will be um, issuing reports that that have that level of detail. Um, and that's why it's important to get to get these standard setting um, committee meetings right. That was great. I'm tempted to leave that as the last word, but I want to ask Carla and Eric, is there anything you want to kind of say as a summation to today's topic? Uh, I want to answer, I'll, I'll answer one thing, and I'd love to hear Casey's thought upon this also. Um, one of the questions out there was, now that you've done a virtual standard setting, would you ever go back to doing an in-person standard setting? Um, and that, that's a really tough question. Um, there's benefits, uh, as we've talked about, to the uh, virtual standard setting in that um, we, we have the opportunity to engage people. Um, I know that I'm working, um, I, I've worked with both national programs and state programs and the ability to bring people from very different parts of, of either the state or the nation to, to engage in this, pro in this process um, without really them needing to travel uh, large distances or to get a hotel room or to find a uh, meeting space. Uh, from a logistics standpoint, there's benefits there. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that I, I know that is missed sometimes with the in-person is those in-person discussions um, and the face-to-face -face questions and the, um, and almost the professional learning that I, I know that teachers have many times communicated to me um, after a standard setting that, that they learned uh, uh, as much about the assessment program from the process, but as well from the other teachers and the perceptions that were communicated throughout the process of how students in schools and districts that are very different from their, from their students um, learn and, and are expected to demonstrate. So, um, I don't know if there's a simple answer to, to that one. I know that we're, we're planning on looking at doing a, uh, a standard setting for, an alter, for alternate science coming up uh, this summer uh, for, for Tennessee. Um, and there's part of me that would love to have that one in person because I know that there's going to be a need, there's going to need to be a lot of discussion between uh, the, the individuals who are the content experts and the individuals that are um, the more special education student experts. Um, but at the same time, that might not be a possibility. So I'm glad we have the opportunity to do it, mm -hmm. um, but it may not be the, the solution for all, all situations. Mm -hmm. Carla, do you have any last thoughts you wanna share? We've got about two minutes left. On this, on this particular topic, but I- Anything about will... standard setting. <laughs> will be more online standard setting and online workshops in general. I do think we'll be going back to seeing in-person ones once we can travel. I know everybody has a desire to have some more connectivity than we have, especially in-person connectivity. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, Marianne, to be part of the discussion. I've loved watching the chat. It was very hard to focus <laughs> on the conversation at the same time. The food is better, and the food is better at the in-person workshops. Oh yeah, as is yeah. the sleeping in the hotels without children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are some side benefits of not having to travel, but we do miss all the interaction. Um, I do want to finish up just by reminding you that we are still doing this every week. Um, so next time, uh, same next week, same time. Uh, we're going to have a presentation on remote administration and remote proctoring, which I expect to be very um, engaging. And this one's gonna focus on K-12 and we've got uh, presenters from three different states um, as well as, as two other speakers to, to talk through the logistics of how this all works. Why would you do it? What are you concerned about? And some questions that came up today about security are really gonna be hit next week about how do you keep items secure when this happens? Um, so again, I wanna appreciate everybody joining and especially being so active on the chat. And again, um, very soon this will be up on our YouTube channel. So please look for NCME's YouTube channel and stay safe and have a great week. Take care everyone. <laughs>